1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Several times in the last two decades I have made a start in this direction and refrained myself from so doing. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. The Holy Spirit of God, not the Apostle Paul, wrote these words. The desire of the Holy Spirit is that men may be saved. If I, for whatever reason, and we'll talk tonight about some reasons, but if I purposely offend a man, if I purposely displease a man, and thereby hinder that man or prevent that man from being saved, I have certainly operated contrary to the will and purposes of the Holy Spirit of God. I do not understand why a saved man or woman, why a saved preacher of the gospel, why a saved pastor would ever use a word that both saved and lost alike understand as being patently offensive under any and every circumstance in which it is used. In fact, it is the, the only single word in our society that can get you fired from a job, banished from a career, shamed into silence and submission, it has no place in the vocabulary of someone who is seeking to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. So obviously the N-word is not Naboth or noodles. I don't know who put that, why I would be preaching on noodles. But to use a derogatory term for a member of the black race that offends the church of God and hinders the salvation of souls that is offensive to the Christian and to the lost man is incredible that we could have ministers standing in pulpits today using that word and congregations laughing and giggling like a bunch of school children and uh, shallow thinkers and Bible rejectors cheering them on. And so tonight I'll give you a dozen things that the use of that word reveals about the one who uses it, and hopefully it'll never be heard again, uh, at least by anyone over whom I have the slightest influence or say, and uh, by anyone that the Word of God uh, governs. Fair enough? Amen. So you can all just relax and, and uh, enjoy a little Bible study tonight. That's what we're here for. Study God's Word and learn from God's Word. Holy Spirit wants people saved. If the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ offends them, that's their problem. If uh, my foolishness offends them, that's my problem. So let's pray together. Our Father, help us tonight. Help us tonight, Father, to love Your Word, learn from Your Word, live by Your Word. Make sure that all that we do is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to put a mark in 1 Corinthians 10, we'll come back there before we're through tonight. Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. Titus 2 verse number 6. Titus 2 verse number 6. These are my instructions from the Holy Spirit. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. These are all of our instructions from the Holy Spirit. 
In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. When a professing Christian uses the N-word, it shows a lack of good works, it shows a lack of uncorrupt doctrine, it shows a lack of gravity, it shows a lack of sincerity. You don't sincerely care about the souls of men or you would not so offend them. Uh, You're not uh, uh, sincerely concerned about showing thyself a pattern of good works, for none would claim that the use of that term is a good work. And more than that, the Bible says in verse number 8 that we are to be possessed of sound speech that cannot be condemned. And you'd be hard-pressed to find a dozen decent people in any community that wouldn't condemn that speech. It's not sound speech. It's speech that will be condemned by the Christian. It's speech that will be condemned by the lost. Uh, you, you may stand and say Jesus saves, and some may be indifferent. Some may agree. Some may disagree. But if you were to proclaim publicly aloud the N word, you would be universally condemned by all but a few ignorant, semi-drunken uh, people who are hoping to wake up and find that it's 1862 and Lee's going to take a bigger force to Gettysburg. Other than that, everybody's going to condemn that speech. Surely there's something better that could come out of our lips than speech that would be universally condemned. Right. The Bible says, having no evil thing to say of you. Let them criticize you preaching the gospel. Let them criticize your righteous living. Let us criticize your, your fidelity to your wife. Let them criticize your, uh, your decency and your, uh, your modesty. Don't give them a legitimate reason to reject you and reject your church and reject your gospel and reject your Savior and to think your pastor must be some kind of ignorant bigot or uh, people that uh, attend, uh, attend that congregation uh, wouldn't be engaged in such behavior. So well, I just don't... Look, it, it, it doesn't matter. We're trying to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Not part of them. All of them. Not some of them. Every one of them. And uh, it's, uh, we're commanded by God to use sound speech that cannot be condemned. All right? Let's turn to Galatians 5, James 2, and Mark 12. Galatians 5, James 2, and Mark 12. This will be fun because it will show that the four Gospels, the Pauline Epistles, and the General Epistles all say exactly the same thing and are in perfect agreement. So Galatians 5, James chapter number 2, and Mark chapter number 12. Galatians 5, James chapter 2. And Mark chapter number 12. Use of insulting and derogatory language violates the second great commandment, and there's only two. Not often you can in one, in one action violate 50% of God's commandments. <laughs> but he summed them up in two. Galatians 5 and verse number 14 says this. Uh, well, let's start 13. For brethren, uh, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God has set us free and given us liberty so that we can love our neighbor as ourselves. The Bible says in uh, James chapter 2 and verse number 8, Fulfill ye the royal law according to the scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. 
But if you have respect of persons, that is, you think one person is more deserving than another, you treat one person different than another, you give one person benefit of the doubt, you assume instantly on the other person, if you have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And then Mark 12, Mark 12 and verse number 30 Start at 29, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Greater than these. So, if I make my boast that I'm a fine Christian because I'm keeping lesser commandments, and then betray that I am, or reveal that I'm not a fine Christian because I'm ignoring the greater commandment, uh, it's not a very good circumstance. To use language that is purposefully offensive, hateful, disrespectful of another man, whatever that language might be, violates the second commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not only that, look at Luke chapter number 10, along these same lines. When the Lord, uh, find it here, Luke 10, uh, verse number 25 Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, now, now who's asking? A lawyer tempting him. This is an unbeliever arguing with, trying to trap Jesus. And he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. So, lost people know that God expects His people to love their neighbor as their self. Lost people know nothing about dress codes. They know nothing about prayer meetings. They know nothing about witnessing. They know nothing about, about Bible study. But a lost person who hears someone who's supposed to be a follower of Jesus Christ Treating a neighbor with hatred, not with love. They're not a lost person in town doesn't know that's out of line. So I cannot show a lack of love to my neighbor without discrediting my testimony and my witness in the eyes of any lost person that may so observe, may observe that and see that happen. All right, number, number four. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, Luke 14, verse 11. To use the N-word or any other uh, insulting and derogatory language of another is the most pathetic form of self-exaltation. Now, here's, here's why insulting someone on the basis of their race is 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 so so sad because to do so you have to imagine that you're superior on the basis of nothing you've ever said or nothing you've ever done right. I'm better than you why well I'm white yeah but what have you ever done to make you better well I, I, I'm white but what have you ever done that makes you better well I'm white so my superiority is based on how I came out of the womb. And you're inferior because you didn't come out of the womb like me. And, and what you're pointing to doesn't go beyond your flesh. So Luke 14.11 says this, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It's a curious thing that when Jesus Christ, when came time to be manifest in the flesh, he had set this thing up where 
it was prophesied and foretold and arranged that when he came to this earth, he would come as the most despised of men. He could have been born to a virgin in Caesar's palace. But he chose to be born to a virgin in a manger amongst the smallest and poorest and most despised and hated people on earth. He made himself of no reputation. And the reputation that he now has, being highly exalted and having a name that's above every name, was given him by his father because he earned it by his sacrificial works and his great accomplishments. He's not highly exalted and given a name above every name because he was born a Jew. Or would he have earned that place had he been born a a non-Jew? God gave him that place because he went to that cross and laid down his life and died to pay for the sins of the whole world. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. Now what got the devil cast down? He just wanted a throne because of who he was. I will ascend. On what basis? I will exalt myself. On what basis? I will be like the most. On what basis? So there's, there's, in all of us, in all of us, there is something that wants self-exaltation. And if we can't have it by attainment, then we'll have it by tearing somebody else down. Look, I'm better. On what basis? Well, I say he's no good. That makes me good. That doesn't make you anything. So we ought to, we ought to avoid uh, self-exaltation, especially with no basis. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 9. First Thessalonians 4 and Romans chapter 9. When I was growing up, I can remember back then. When I was growing up, every year, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, every year there'd be one boy in a class who was king sized. He got the business. There'd be a boy or girl every year had buck teeth. They got the business. Boy, back in those days, everybody didn't get braces. You just, boy, you, you, your teeth stuck out funny. They just stuck out funny your whole life. They made fun of you. Somebody be real tall, skinny, so make fun of them. Somebody walk with a limp, they make fun of you. Uh, Jeff Parrish had a glass eye. People would made, would have made fun of him, but he was, had failed a time or two. He was about six inches bigger than everybody else and beat, beat your brains in. He'd take a pencil, he'd, he'd tap his eyeball with it. How about something freak you out before lunch, man? You see somebody tapping their eyeball with a with a pencil. But you know, people are different. Always get made fun of. That's that's what people do. But here's what the Bible says about that, boys and girls. First Thessalonians four verse seven. God had not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Amen. He therefore that despiseth. Now watch despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. Now, to use the N-word or other derogatory language of someone because of their physical appearance, according to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, shows a heart that despises God. Look, let, let's, let's separate for the younger generation. Let's separate the real world from your imaginary computer life. Those computer screen names, those aren't your friends. Those people you've never met that you don't talk to, that's not your social network. And typing half words and sentences with no punctuation, that's not talking. Okay? So, in heaven, you don't sit there and and pick, I'm going to be white and I'm going to have blonde hair and and I'm going to make my little, what do they call it? Uh, what is it? Avatar. Okay. You don't do that. God. Remember him? Said in the Bible. Remember that? 
that He formed us. He made us, not we ourselves. He made us. We're His people, sheep of His pasture. So, you're not saying, ha, 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 look at that guy. He's got slanty eyes. He didn't make those eyes. God made those eyes. He didn't sign up for that. God formed that man with his hands. You're going to meet that artist one day. But be careful what you say about his artwork. God could have made everybody your color. But obviously he didn't feel it necessary to do so. And he didn't make other people of other colors so you could know you were better. He made all men according to his... He he said he made man his image, his likeness. That's what he said. And and the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 8, when you start despising the artwork, it's not the artwork you're criticizing, it's the artist you're criticizing. I'd be careful about that. Romans chapter 9 says this. Romans 9... Verse number 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Now, maybe you're an evolutionist and you just believe that everything's just uh, genetics and reproduction and God doesn't have a hand in it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't find that taught in Scripture. You just believe it's all genetics. How come you, when you're expecting a child, why do you pray to God for a healthy baby? Why don't you just wait and see what the gene pool gives you? When that child's born, hands here and eyes there, everything where it's supposed to be, how come you thank God? Why don't you say, well, I sure fell in a good, in a good spot in the genetic, uh, evolutionary process here. Now, if God made you, then He made that guy. And if God made that guy, He made the guy standing next to Him. And if God, if God made him, I'd be real careful making fun of God. Amen. I'd be careful about that. All right, Acts 17, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 3. Acts 17. So what have we got so far? Uh, use of the N-word is patently offensive to the Christian and the lost man. It offends the church of God and hinders the salvation of souls. It is speech that can and should be condemned, and the Christian is called upon to use sound speech that cannot be condemned. It violates the second great commandment. Even the lost know this. It's a pathetic form of self-exaltation, for one imagines himself superior on the basis of nothing he's ever said or done. It shows a heart that despises God. I'd be careful about that heart and any preacher that encouraged it. Now, Acts 17 says this, and here's our next reason. It shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the Word of God. Let's see what the Word of God says about uh, different types of men. The Bible says in Acts 17, 26, And it's made of one blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, that the term of the times foreappointed, the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. So, anybody you see on a city bus at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they've all got the same blood. It's Adam's blood. Every one of them came the same place. Every one of them bleeds the same. Adam's blood. No difference. No difference. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. Well, how about spiritually? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's only two options you got biblically. You don't have a black option, a white option, a yellow option, a brown option, a red option. You've got in Christ, in Adam. Somebody's in Christ, that's what matters. Somebody's in Adam, that's what matters. The rest of it doesn't matter. See that man? Sir, can I talk to you? Are you saved? The Lord's your Savior? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. He's in Adam. That's all you need to know. That's all that matters. The rest of it doesn't matter. Why, why doesn't the rest of it matter? 
Well, I would witch that guy, but, uh, you know, he's Korean, and uh, we don't want to get too many Koreans in the church. Well, if he gets saved, he won't be a Korean. He'll be a Christian. He's either in Adam or he's in Christ. Now, Romans 3 says this. Romans 3, verse number 22. Romans Corinthians. Romans 3, verse 22. He said, well, I read these books one time. I've read, I've read some of those books, too. So I did, a man did this study one time. Yeah, I know, but right now we're talking about the Bible, not Amen. something that you might consider to be superior to the Bible. Amen. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, verse number 22, Even the righteousness of God, which by the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, if a man's not saved and he's white, and another man stands beside him is not saved, and he's uh, Latino, according to you, there might be a difference. According to God, there is no difference. Right. So well, that guy, that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that guy there is a, a, a real sinner. Why? Well, well look, he's, he's, he's brown. That guy's white. I mean, I'd put my money on the brown guy being the sinner any day. Yeah, but your money, you're going to lose, your, you're going to lose the bet. Lord says, there's no difference. Well, there's a guy there. I mean, that, that, see that brown guy? Put him, next, put, put him next to that black guy? I'm telling you right now, that black guy. Really? Where'd you get that? The Bible says there's no difference. Among, lo, among lost men, there's no difference. Now, what would happen if that brown man or that red man or that white man or that mixture of all three or, or that none of the above what would happen if that man trusted Jesus Christ as his savior and the Lord granted him a new birth and, and saved his soul then there'd be no difference they'd both be equally saved and they'd both be full fledged members of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ so before they're saved, there's no difference. And after they're saved, there's no difference. Why would a saved person who knows and believes the Bible be trying to establish that there's a difference? Why are you letting man's experiences or man's ideas, whether you could verify them or not verify them, or you whether you've read something to support or not, why are you letting that trump the Bible? Would you do that in any other area? I would hope not. So there's no difference, according to the Bible. Now, uh, that, th- those verses primarily deal with people in their natural state before they get saved. How about saved people? Let's go to Acts 2 and Colossians 3. Acts 2 and Colossians 3. Next thing we learn about the use of such language is it shows a fundament- fundamental misunderstanding of the church. Acts 2 and Colossians 3. We took some young men one night. We were on a, on a trip. We took some young men to a, to a church for a midweek service. And there was a guest preacher there. And I won't, uh, I won't do anything to help him or hinder him by mentioning his name. We got there that night and there were uh, probably about 120 people there. And none of them were of God's chosen race that I could tell. There were probably about probably uh, 80 people were white, and about 20 were Hispanic, and about 20 were black. This guy got up with a Bible in his a King James Bible in his hand, preached for 20 minutes, and then went and put on a coat. And the back of the coat was a big confederate flag. And he walked around that church. He said, you don't like that? you got a problem. Why don't you just hit the road? Now, what part of Bible Christianity was that? I've missed that. His sole intent and purpose was to offend and divide the body of Christ. There's, there's, there's no other purpose. 
Is somebody going to get closer to Jesus that way? Is somebody going to want to witness more that way? Is somebody going to have a better prayer life because of that? Or was that just somebody whose flesh was more important to him? His old, his old carnal flesh meant more to him than his new birth and his being part of the body of Jesus Christ. Right. He, he'd rather be white than be part of Jesus' body. Because Jesus' body got some people in it he wished weren't there. Right. Now, watch this thing. This is Acts chapter 2 and verse number 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Out of every nation under heaven. Uh, And then he names them Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Jews, strange problems like Cretes, Arabians. I bet those people didn't all look the same. I bet they didn't all have the same accent. I bet they didn't all eat the same food. I bet they all had different B.O. <laughs> but they did. Now, guess what happened to these people from every nation under heaven? Verse 37 now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. From where? Every nation under heaven. Amen. God put them all in one church. And, and verse 42 and the white ones continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And the ones that weren't sufficiently white were not allowed to eat with them and fellowship with them. And verse number 44, and they that believed were together and had all things common, uh, just the white ones. The other ones were going to steal everything and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. That's the white ones gave it to the non-white ones because, you know, they were just bums anyway. And they... Now, you know what, it, it just, it's offensive and grievous to just even try and joke like that. None of that even entered in the minds of these people. They now have a common bond in Jesus Christ that makes everything else insignificant. Amen. Verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. I wonder if they just went to the houses of the people who looked like them. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. Now look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 8. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds, and to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Doesn't matter. Circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't matter. Barbarian, Scythian, doesn't matter. Bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Why is it Christ plus American, Christ plus Northerner, Christ plus Southerner, Christ plus my color, Christ plus my economic level? Why, why, why are you adding something to Jesus Christ so you can say, well, I mean, you might be a Christian, but I'm a white Christian. Who cares? What you're doing is you're elevating something to a superior place than your relationship to Jesus Christ. I don't want to be anything but a Christian. I don't want to have a fish sign on one side of my car and my favorite ball team on the other side of my car. I want to be a Christian. That's what I want. I want that identity. I belong to Jesus Christ. Why would I prevent the lost from being saved or hinder the union of the body of Christ, the unity of the body of Christ, by exalting something over my Christianity? I'll fellowship with you because you're not only a Christian, you're my color Christian. 
but I'll not fellowship with you because you may be washed in the blood and bone of Jesus, bone and flesh of Jesus, flesh, and you may be part of the body of Jesus Christ, but you don't look like me. So you're not, you're not fit for my fellowship. I can't justify that. Fundamental misunderstanding of the church. Now, Proverbs 16, here's a good one. Proverbs 16 and Romans 1. Proverbs chapter 16 and Romans chapter number 1. That world will wear you out. You're not careful, their, their carnal nature will bring yours to the surface. Amen. They start cussing you and cussing you and cussing you and cussing you. Pretty soon you start cussing back. It's Christian cussing, but it's, it's all the same. Now this N-word, let's, let's... It raises a question. Proverbs 16, verse 28. A forward mouth soweth strife. And a whisperer separateth chief friends. Whispering is divisive. Two people be best friends. One starts talking about the other one behind his back. Saying, saying this about him, that about him. Before long, the whole thing's torn up. Now, let me ask you something. If there's a bunch of people around and you say, see that guy over there? Look at that guy. See that guy right over there? He's a... The fact that you have to whisper that right. is testament that you know it's offensive. Yeah. You know it doesn't match your testimony. You know it's not consistent with your profession as a Christian, or you wouldn't lower your voice and whisper because you know that shouldn't be heard right. by others. Amen. Here's what I want to know. What other, what other things are coming out of your mouth that aren't fit for people to hear? What other things are bubbling up in that heart that you have to lower the volume because you only want you only want certain people to get that? Look, it's got to be whispered. It 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 shouldn't be said. If this one can hear it, but not that one. If if it's okay, if, you know, if if that group's all right with them, that, that why? Is that is that? Not a fair question. Romans one twenty nine. Romans one twenty nine. Right, Romans one. Well, those homosexuals. Yeah, those homosexuals. Sure against that, aren't we? I am. I don't know about you. That's wrong. It's wrong. Verse twenty eight. Even that did not like King God in their knowledge. God gave them over a great mind. Do those things are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. Hope you wouldn't do that. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Hope you wouldn't do that. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. Look, it's right there in the middle of the verse. We ought not be using words that we don't want God saved women hearing. Amen. We ought not be using words we don't want our Sunday school children hearing. We ought not be using words that would uh, hinder our presentation of the gospel. Look, this world has been conditioned by those movies, not television. You know what they think you are? They think you are an ignorant bigot who doesn't have enough brains in his head to do anything but go to church. When you use this word, you confirm all of their suspicions and false accusations. There it is. There that's that's them. They're just they're just they're just like the people in that movie I saw. Whispering ought to be out. Number ten, the use of the N word <laughs> denies any understanding of human history or church history. God's people through the centuries have been persecuted by Roman Catholics, communists, Muslims, Hindus, None of them are black. I've got, I've got the full set of Fox's Book of Martyrs in there. Tiny print, four columns, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. You know who's killed God's people the last 2,000 years? White people. <laughs> you hadn't read about the great Aztec persecution of the Christians. You hadn't read about the great Watusi Inquisition. The people who killed your forefathers were whiter than you. People that burned your forefathers at the stake and put them on the rack and chopped them into pieces looked like you do. <laughs> well, I tell you, those black people, really, when have they ever persecuted the church? I'll tell you who has. Japheth, with a, with a good bit of help from his old buddy Ishmael, those Muslims cut your throat. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta convert that man to Islam before he'll cut your throat or blow up your airplane. That's how that goes. I'm talking about as a Christian now. See, see, some people too, too concerned about being an American. Right. Bless God, I red, white, blue, wave the flag. Well, it's, you know, it's like I said this morning, it's better than any other country as far as I can tell. But you got something better than that. Amen. You're a Christian. Amen. Get Jesus Christ. That ought to be our flag we follow. All right, James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Here we go. James chapter number 3. James chapter 3. Oh, one more for like James 3. One more reason shouldn't use that word. It's it's childish. It's childish. First Corinthians thirteen eleven. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, moms, dads, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to offend. I don't. I, I've, I've avoided. I've not even told you what we're talking about tonight. I'd use the word. Not going to. So, so if you want, just for a second, just you know, plug those little ears. But, but here's here's a bunch of kids in the hall. They're three years old, four years old. They're all in a group. And one of them says, I went poo-poo. And all the other kids go, oh, he said poo-poo, he said poo-poo. <laughs> Grown-ups don't. Grown-ups don't go, oh, it's Chris, did you hear that? He said, he said poo-poo. Oh. But every, this guy, I, I, I hear these guys, I, 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 I'm listening to some, some guy preach, and he's preaching all of a sudden, in the middle of his preaching in a pulpit, he'll say, and these, and he'll throw out the N-word, and you hear these guys go, <laughs> he, th- he said the N-word, <laughs> he said the bro in the pulpit, <laughs> what are you, four years old? What? <laughs> huh? We can't even gauge the, the, the level of that spiritual immaturity. It's, it's off the bottom of the charts. You're, that preacher's your hero because he said poo poo in the hall and made you giggle? Come on. We got a higher calling than that. We got, we got better things to talk about in the, in the pulpit and in our Literature and in our conversation than that. Right, you're right. All right, James three. We all struggle with the flesh. I'd say that's true. If if you don't have that problem, uh, thank you for coming back down from heaven to visit us. <laughs> but nowhere is that struggle more evident than by the conflicting things that come out of our mouth. Verse number 2, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. For we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven with fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. He said, it doesn't take much to... to control a horse. It doesn't take much to control a ship on the ocean. But, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a uh, little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body, set on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire of hell. 
For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed, hath been tamed mankind. But the tongue can no man tame is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. He said the last thing, last thing any of us ever get control of is that tongue. Isn't that something? Just, just tied to hell. Verse 9. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men which are made, look... Therewith curse we men which are made out the similitude of God. So blessing God the Father and cursing a man because of his appearance are, are directly opposite. That's, that's the example God picked. He didn't say therewith bless we God and therewith tell we a little white lie. He didn't say therewith bless we God and therewith we sing rock and roll music. He said we bless God and we curse men who are made in his likeness. That's the example that he picked to show how out of control our tongue is. Verse number 10, out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now here's the difference. Here's the difference. Here's what shows my true character. It's not what I say I believe. Here's what shows my true character. Out of my mouth can come praise to the Lord. And out of my mouth can come cursing. If cursing comes out of my mouth and I'm okay with that, that reveals my character. Look, the, the, the right thing be is, look, sometimes, I'm not justifying it, but probably all of us who were unsaved for any length of time and then got saved, there's probably been some situation of a smash toe or a, an, an incident where a word came out of your mouth from the old days. And as soon as it did, your character was revealed because you... Oh, I can't believe I said that. God, forgive me. I'm so sorry. It wasn't that the Word came out because you still got old man, new man. But when that old man manifests itself by the misuse of the tongue, if your character's right in what it ought to be, you instantly deal with their sorrow and repentance and... But boy, just use that tongue like a lost man would use it. In fact, to use that tongue in ways a lost man wouldn't use it. And to to be okay with it. That's a character issue. And needs to be dealt with. Whatever whatever, uh, word or speech or language it might be. We ought not be tearing each other down. Insult and criticizing and and uh, and, and all all that it shouldn't shouldn't be shouldn't be. Now, I don't have a verse for this. But I, well, I could I could have several verses for this. But the only alibi I've ever heard for using this word is, well, they call each other by that name, which is really weird. Which is really weird. Watch this. I hate those people because they're black. So much that I want to talk like them. (laughs) That's pretty weird. Why are you using that word? Well, you know me and the rappers. We just, you know, I, I, I want to talk like a rapper. What else have you learned from them? I mean, to say, and you know what? There, there again, that, there's that, there's that, well, they call each other that. Really? I know a lot of black men. Of course, I hang out with saved ones, not lost ones. I've never heard them call each other that. I've never heard a black mother call her child that. Not a saved one. That's, that's who I hang out with. Now, if you're hanging out with rappers and, and watching rap videos and you hear that word on there and so you're okay with it, I, I gotta, I gotta think that's pretty weird. I mean, what could be funnier than a, 
neo-Nazi's girlfriend going to the tanning salon. <laughs> you got you got to admit that's that's pretty weird, man. <laughs> He, he's all for white power, but his girlfriend's browning up under the under the geode lights. <laughs> Very bizarre. First Corinthians ten. First Corinthians ten. Let's go back where we started. First Corinthians ten. I want everybody in town to get saved. The only way I know for them to be saved is to tell them about Jesus. If telling them about Jesus, if they reject my scriptural presentation of the gospel, I'm, I'm sorry that they did, but I am not responsible to God for their lost condition. But if after I have given them the gospel... They then sit two tables away from me in a restaurant and hear me refer to them by some insulting, derogatory term. And they say, oh yeah, and I want that. Now it's on me. Now it's on me. I don't want it on me. Somebody's going to hell. I don't want it to be because I was out promoting Republican or Democrat. I don't want to be because I was taking sides in a war that ended 150 years ago. I don't want to be because I think I was born better than they were. Just Let's just stick to the gospel. And not have times in our life when we stick to the gospel and the rest of the time, flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit. The idea is to be in the spirit all the time. Not just during those hours when we clock in for God. All right, now let's look where we started. Give none offense, neither the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Look at verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat, that's not very spiritual, is it? Just day-to-day life. Or drink. Or whatsoever you do. Do all to the glory of God. Now if I, if I, if I'm not at church, I don't have my Jesus Save shirt on, I'm incognito out in public. And I stub my toe and cuss. And somebody hears me. If I stub my toe and dust, because, and nobody hears me. Do you really think Jesus Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, said, that's why I went to the cross? Come on, he went to that cross so we could now live a life that brings him glory. Not so I could justify what I want to do or make excuses for what I want to do. So I could bring Him glory. The purpose of our life is to bring glory to God. And brothers and sisters, if the words coming out of our mouth do not bring glory to God, they shouldn't be coming out of our mouth. If they hinder the gospel, they shouldn't be coming out of our mouth. If they create any kind of division within the body of Christ, they shouldn't be coming out of our mouth. And James 3 says what comes out of our mouth is... First came out of a heart. So I need to get that stuff out of my heart. Now I'm a, I'll say this and I, then I'm through. In, in, my, in my 30 years of Christian, I've been through three church splits where someone set out to end my ministry, where someone set out to either greatly harm or destroy a King James Bible-believing, soul-winning New Testament church. And every one of those people were white, married to someone who was white, and all four parents were white. What's the point? The point is, where do you get this idea that 
You can see somebody coming on the sidewalk from two blocks away and determine their character. That's, that is, it's, it just doesn't even make sense. Character is what's in your heart. And the quickest way to find out what somebody's, when somebody's heart is keep an ear close to the exit. What's in the heart exits out between the lips. And so, let's have good heart. Let's love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Let's love our neighbors, ourself. The unsaved neighbor, there's no difference. They're all the same. Saved neighbors, no difference. They're all the same. One's in Adam, one's in Christ. We need to reach all the lost. We need to be a blessing to all the saved. Fair enough? All right. That's the N-word sermon. And it's good we didn't say what the N-word was because you plug in all kinds of words there. Don't be sitting there trying to think of how many of them you plug in there. That's, that, wasn't, that wasn't the idea. All right, let's pray. Father, Father, help me. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to just be saved. I want to be a Christian. I want to be like Christ. Lord, I'm glad. I'm glad that you cared for that publican and that Samaritan woman and that Syrophoenician woman. I'm glad you were light to the Gentiles. I'm glad, Lord, that you came to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And I thank you, Lord, that when you save me, that you put me in your body and I have no reason to be there. I didn't deserve it. I wasn't worthy of it. And so, Lord, that must be true of everybody else that's in your body. And, and, and I just pray you'd help me to love you with all my heart, love my neighbors, myself. I pray you'd help every one of us do the same. Please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.